So yet again, we have another one of uh, Jim Jordan's hearings, a House hearing where it's not necessarily about determining the facts. It's not necessarily, in this case, uh, paying respects to those who, you know, laid down lives in Afghanistan. It's none of this. It is, and this is probably the most untasteful, unpleasant thing about what you're about to see. It is all about can political points be scored to use uh, on behalf of Trump in the forthcoming election. That's what it's down to. If, whether it's Lincoln Riley, it doesn't matter what the subject is. There is never any interest in the, the substance, the facts. It's just projection with zero care for anybody who gets in the way. If Jim Jordan can make a point uh, to get a soundbite on Fox, that is the simple goal. And McCall, who you can see in the background, while well, he's, excuse the pun, uh, one of Jim's On April 14th, 2021, President Biden announced the United States would unilaterally withdraw its military forces from Afghanistan. For months before that announcement, the intelligence community and his senior military advisors, including both gentlemen testifying here today, issued dire warnings about the withdrawal's consequences. After the announcement, I, along with other Republican and Democrat members of Congress, urged the president to prepare for the withdrawal and its inevitable fallout. Unfortunately, those warnings were ignored. As the withdrawal date neared, the situation in Afghanistan deteriorated as the Taliban gained significant ground across the country. Yet the Biden administration's failure to plan for their withdrawal threatened the safety and security of U.S. personnel in the country. As a result, in July of 2021, 23 State Department employees in Kabul sent a dissent cable channel to Secretary Blinken warning of their grave concerns for Afghanistan's stability and for their own safety. Yet nothing was done. Instead, our investigation uncovered the White House refused to listen to warnings about the situation on the ground. Disturbingly, we have uncovered that State Department leadership prohibited, prohibited its employees from even uttering the word NEO, shorthand for emergency evacuation, until as late as August of 2021. Too little, too late. Additionally, this committee learned that the State Department did not even request an emergency evacuation until after Kabul was surrounded by the Taliban. As a result, the airport was not secured until August 17th, two days after Kabul fell. As the saying goes, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And fail, they did. The next two weeks created an international outrage and humiliation for the United States. People all over the world watched as babies were flung over barbed wire fence by mothers without hope. Desperate Afghans fell to their deaths from airplanes and hordes of people surrounded the airport as they tried to flee for their lives. The damage to our reputation and our credibility the United States credibility around the world, that damage will last for generations. Our service members were forced to watch as American citizens and Afghan allies were beaten and murdered outside the gates of the airport. These brave Americans were told to stand by as terrorists brutalized innocent civilians. And then, then on the morning of August 26, we watched in horror as reports of a terrorist attack at Abbey Gate flooded the news. 13 U.S. service members were murdered, with dozens more injured. 170 Afghans were killed, with countless injured as well. Some of the Abbey Gate Gold Star families members are here today, and we honor you. We honor your sacrifice here today. 
To the families here today and to the American people, I say, I will not rest until I get to the bottom of this tragedy. You deserve answers. The American people deserve answers. And I intend to deliver. When the last U.S. military plane left on August 30th, 2021, more than 1,000 American citizens remained trapped in Afghanistan, as were tens of thousands of Afghan allies who risked their lives serving beside our troops and diplomats. M many, if not most, of those allies are still trapped constantly in fear for their lives. I want to thank both of our witnesses for being here today. Despite current DOD officials actively trying to limit your testimony, you have agreed to appear here voluntarily. And I'm grateful to you, both of you, sirs, for your service to our country and your service to this investigation. I also want to thank the Abigate Gold Star families for joining us here today. And while the president has never publicly stated the names of your children, I will here today. Their names are Darren Hoover, Johanny Rosario, Nicole G, Hunter Lopez, Dagan Page, Humberto Sanchez, David Espinoza, Jared Schmitz, Riley McCollum, Dylan Marola, Karim Nakui, Maxton Soviak, and Ryan Noss. Those are the names of the fallen. May God bless them. They will not be forgotten. Thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks and members of the committee, and thank you for your efforts and what you're doing. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with General McKenzie, and my purpose here today is to help you form a holistic assessment of our efforts in Afghanistan. But most importantly, I am personally here today, voluntarily, to help the families of the fallen, the 13 fallen at Abbey Gate, and the thousands of fallen and tens of thousands of wounded and countless other members who suffered the invisible wounds of war, to help them get answers. I'm humbled to be here today with three Gold Star families from Abbey Gate, and I know the other families couldn't make it, but I intend to contact them in the coming weeks. They know my feelings for them. They know that there are no words by me or any general or any politician or anyone that can ever bring back their fallen. But all of us can and all of us must honor their sacrifice to protect our country and to be forever grateful that they answered the call to the colors. Each of them paid the ultimate sacrifice on the altar of freedom, like so many before them, in order to keep our nation safe. And we owe them answers. And I am committed to assist in the effort to get them answers. But we should also not be under any illusion. We're not going to get all the answers here today. It's a process that's going to take a considerable length of time. And we must also recognize that much of the record, in fact, is classified and beyond the scope of this open hearing. So over two decades, between 2001 and 2021, about 800,000 of us in uniform in the United States military served in Afghanistan and thousands of others from many agencies in our government. Of those 2,461 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines gave their lives. Almost 30,000 more were wounded in action and countless author others suffered those invisible wounds. And that includes the 13 from Abbey Gate. We must always honor all of their sacrifice, each of them, over two decades of fighting the Taliban, bringing Osama bin Laden to justice, and ultimately protecting the American homeland. We lost over 200 U.S. and international troops and many more wounded in action in units that were under my direct command in several tours and multiple years of combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And every commander who's ever served in combat knows that we personally issued the orders that gave the task, the purpose, the place, and the time of that soldier's death or wounds. And we also know it was the enemy 
that killed or wounded them. Combat's an unforgiving environment, and those of us who have served in the brutality of ground combat live with that dark reality every day and every night, and we'll live with that for the rest of the days of our lives. There's no military leader who's lost troops in combat who does not know that feeling. So this is personal to me, and I will do everything in my power to ensure that these families and all of our veterans and families know the truth and have the answers. At the peak of our military commitment in 2011, the United States had just over 100,000, or just under 100,000 troops and about 20,000 DOD contractors. That same year, the United States began to steadily draw down troops, close bases, and retrograde equipment. Nothing we're going to discuss today happened overnight. It was a process of withdrawal that spanned a decade. The outcome in Afghanistan was the cumulative effect of many decisions over many years of war. And like any complex phenomena, there's no single causal factor that determined the outcome, but multiple factors in combination. In the fall of 2020, as I previously testified publicly, my analysis, my personal analysis, was that an accelerated withdrawal would likely lead to the general collapse of the Afghan security forces and the Afghan government, resulting in a large-scale civil war reminiscent of the 1990s or a complete Taliban takeover. In November 2020, DOD received orders from the White House to reduce troop levels to 2,500 by January 15, 21. When the current administration took office in January 21, there were roughly speaking 2,500 U.S. troops on the ground with about 22,000 NATO troops and contractors. Beginning in February 21, the National Security Council conducted a 10-week interagency review of the Doha Agreement, and various options were presented and debated. In previous public testimony, I noted that at that time, my analysis based on my assessment and the recommendations of the commanders, to include General McKenzie, and the consensus of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was that we needed to maintain a minimum force of 2,500 troops on the ground, mostly special forces with allied troops and contractors in order to sustain the Afghan National Security Forces and its government until the diplomatic conditions of the Doha Agreement were met. Without this support, it was my view at the time that it was only a matter of when, not if, the Afghan government would collapse and the Taliban would take control. Again, I previously publicly testified, and I consistently supported a negotiated end of the war, but only if there was a reduction in violence leading to a permanent ceasefire, and there were Afghan-to-Afghan -Afghan negotiations leading to a power-sharing agreement between the Afghan government and the Taliban, and it was my view that absent those conditions, I was not in favor of a unilateral withdrawal of U.S. forces because of my assessment of the associated costs and risks. The fundamental t tension facing the president, in fact, two presidents, was that no one could satisfactorily explain when or even if those conditions would ever be met. And if we stayed indefinitely, an open war would likely begin with the Taliban again with increased risk of additional casualties. On 14 April 21, President Biden made the formal announcement of his decision to honor the Doha Agreement with a mil military withdrawal while maintaining a continued diplomatic presence. The Department of Defense understood that our mission was to conduct a retrograde of the remaining U.S. military forces and equipment while leaving a small contingent to defend the American Embassy while diplomatic outcomes were negotiated. On 14 August, the non-combatant evacuation operation decision was made by the Department of State, and the U.S. military alerted, marshaled, mobilized, and rapidly deployed faster than any military in the world could ever do. It is my assessment that that decision came too late. The deploying forces quickly took operational control of the airport with significant elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, Marines, National Guard, and Special Forces, along with our CIA partners and selected NATO forces. Additionally, we set up multiple bases to process evacuees in other countries throughout the Middle East, Europe, and CONUS. In short, the United States military performed one of the most incredible evacuations under pressure in recorded history in an extremely difficult, dynamic, and dangerous environment. That performance is due to the individual bravery, competence, and compassion of every private to general who had any role in this NEO. At the end of 20 years, we, the military, helped build an army, a state, but we could not forge a nation. The enemy occupied Kabul, the overthrow of the government occurred, and the military we supported for two decades faded away. That is a strategic failure. But the military also provided hope for 20 years to the Afghan people. We provided 
unprecedented opportunity to millions. In the final days, we gave 130,000 people their lives and freedom at very high cost. And most importantly, we protected the United States from terrorist attack from Afghanistan, which was our original mission, and that mission continues today. There are many lessons to be learned from 20 years of war and the 10-year drawdown of forces and the final evacuation. And Mr. Chairman, I have a lengthier paper uh, for a written testimony that I would like to submit for the record with your permission. Without objection, so ordered. To the American people, the most important lesson, I think, to learn is that your troops, the United States military, from private to general, did all that bravery and duty could ever do. Your military defended you successfully for 20 years and continues to do that. And for that, every American should be eternally grateful. To all the veterans of Afghanistan, hold your heads high. And I know there are several in the room today. Know that you did your duty. Each of you did what your country asked of you under extreme circumstances. Many of you, like Congressman Mass, lost limbs and were grievously wounded. And you did it selflessly with professionalism, courage, compassion, and with great sacrifice. And finally, to the Gold Star families that are here with us today and those that couldn't make it. There's nothing that I can say or do that's going to fill that gaping hole in your heart. But as I've told you before, I'm committed and I will honor that commitment to get you the answers, to get you to the truth. And I will personally, and I know everyone else will as well, honor your sacrifice and the sacrifice of your loved one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to it.